first of all, I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Um, my name is Susan Lambu, and I'm the manager of uh, the Sport Manitoba Coaching Department. And uh, thank you for coming to our, Kelly, is this our second or third? Second? Second in our PD series that normally we have a get together on a weekend, Friday, Saturday night, where we get together and have some fun and mingle and learn some great things. But uh, as all of you know, we are doing online stuff. So we will continue doing it um, actually through our next one we have scheduled uh, at the beginning of March and Neil Prokop from our performance center will be on along with possibly Jeff Woods to discuss some um, injury prevention or testing. We're kind of figuring out what exactly, but uh, people from our performance center will be on. Yeah, it'll be a little, I think, load management too, and just kind of progressing loads, especially as athletes come out of lockdown. I think it's kind of the plan that we've been, or idea we've kind of been talking about and throwing out. Perfect. And we will send that uh, specific date out, but it'll be one of the first two weeks in May. Okay. So without further ado, um, I want to acknowledge the land in which we are uh, learning on today is located in on the original lands of the Anish, oh goodness, Anish, Anish Nabi. Kylo, can you say it for me? Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Um, and now I would like to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Amy Bender. She is the Director of Clinical Sleep uh, Science at uh, Cerebra, um, a Winnipeg company, and an Adjunct Assistant Professor of Kinesiology at the University of Calgary. She received her PhD and Master of Science degree in ex experimental psychology from Washington State University specializing in sleep, EEG. She has helped develop the only validated sleep screening tool for athletes and has implemented sleep uh, optimization strategies for numerous Canadian Olympic and professional teams. Her current interests focus on how sleep and exercise interventions can improve mental health outcomes. She was a former college basketball athlete, did an Ironman in 2009, and now currently chases her three young kids around. So Amy, or Dr. Bender, pardon me, I will actually let you take it over and enjoy everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for hosting this event. I think it's really great that um, sleep is a part of this. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see that. Um, just get a little. Yes, order. that looks great. Okay, perfect. Um, you know, as a college basketball player myself, and this was, you know, early 2000s, um, the only thing my coach really told me was make sure you're getting a good night's sleep, you know, um, yeah, make sure you're getting to bed early. That was kind of the advice that he, he gave us as a team. And um, I think we've learned a lot more since then as to how much sleep can improve performance. And another part of this is, you know, as coaches, you may think that helping your athletes sleep better is kind of out of your control. But I'm hoping that I'm going to give you a lot of strategies that you can take home today a lot more tools that you can put in your toolbox to actually help your athletes sleep better. I also wanted to mention, so I was planning on, we were planning on doing a project with uh, Kylo's wife, Donna, um, and looking at coaches in the Olympic program and studying their sleep. And unfortunately, a bunch of things happened and we couldn't get that going, but I'm hoping that this information will also apply, like think of it as applying to your athletes, but also applying to yourself as well. So for the first part of my presentation, I'm going to look at uh, the science of sleep. I'll give you a little information on that, why sleep is important for athletes, and then what you can actually do as a coach to help your athletes sleep better. Learning objectives, so at the end of this presentation, learners will be able to identify what good sleep is, dispel some common sleep myths, and then apply sleep strategies for your athletes. 
So first part, let's look at the science of sleep. But before we get there, I wanted to just do a little poll here. I want to see how you have been sleeping during the pandemic. So you can use the QR code here, or you can go to slido.com and enter in this uh, number and um, go ahead and, and start putting in some words as to how you've been sleeping during the pandemic. Maybe I have to press a button here. Um, okay, here we go. It's working. So a lot. Soundly amazing. This is great. Um, so some people interrupted for sure. Nothing else to do. Why not sleep a lot? Um, so that's great. I mean, we do see in the research, we see that about 15% of adults are actually sleeping worse due to the pandemic. Here we got some more answers coming. Um, sporadic, lots of screens, amazing, so restless. So we have probably more people maybe not sleeping as well as those who are sleeping a little bit better. Um, and we do typically see 15% or so of adults are having problems sleeping during the pandemic. They call it the uh, corona somnia, COVID somnia. And actually, um, if you guys, I'm going to be talking about this on CTV tomorrow at, it's around 845. Um, so CTV Winnipeg, um, they're interviewing me on how people are sleeping during the pandemic. So definitely check that out if you can, uh, CTV Winnipeg, so about 845. Um, but there is a certain percentage who are actually sleeping better during the pandemic, and that tends to be our youth. So our teenagers, our young adults are actually sleeping better during the pandemic, and that's probably likely due to the fact that they have more flexibility in their schedule. They can go to bed a little bit later, wake up a little bit later, which is more in line with their biology, which I'm going to talk about in a few slides. So why do we sleep? If sleep does not serve some vital function, then it's the biggest mistake the evolutionary process ever made. So I really like this quote. This is from a pioneer sleep, sleep medicine. Um, and it is, it's a significant chunk of our time. And so there must be a lot of uh, important processes are going on during that time. I wanted to touch on how sleep loss can impact physical health. And these are some of the comorbid diseases that are occurring um, as it relates to sleep loss. So those people who aren't getting enough sleep or that their sleep quality is poor, we do see relationships between obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, cancer Alzheimer's disease, and quicker mortality as well. But I wanted to give you one example. So I'm hoping eventually we can eliminate changing our clocks, but um, when we lose an hour of sleep and it's actually coming up, I think within a couple of weeks, I think it's somewhere around mid-March, um, we do see a 24% increase in heart attacks just by losing this one hour of sleep. So the Monday after daylight saving time, where we spring ahead, lose an hour, we see increases in heart attacks of about 24%. And interestingly, on the in the fall, the fall back, we actually see a decrease in heart attacks. So it, so it is pretty interesting that even just an hour of sleep loss can cause um, these kind of problems. And there's also increases in accidents, increases in suicide, uh, just overall uh, increases in car accidents and workplace accidents that occur in this hour of sleep loss. So that's just something to keep in mind. I like to use that example. So let's talk about three keys of optimal sleep. So um, and I wonder if this will work actually. No. Okay. Um, 
sorry about that, but I, I thought it was maybe more important than asking you about your sleep if I if I presented some results of a previous talk that I did with high school athletes. So right in the age range that you're working with, this was a, a, a school, a very St. Francis school in California. So they're really big on athletics. They had me do a talk for them. So this will kind of give you a sense of you're probably working with similar demographics. Um, what kind of sleep your athletes are probably getting. So that, yeah, that's what I did here instead of pulling you specifically. I thought it'd be better to show you kind of what it might look like for your athletes. And for, for an adolescent athlete, you know, we're looking at an ideal amount of around eight to 10 hours. So that's ideal. Um, in this particular group, only about a third were meeting that recommendation. Um, uh, 43% or so were between seven and eight, which is under sleeping technically. And then we have about, you know, 27% here or 20, 26% who are getting six, seven or less hours of sleep. So pretty, a quarter of your athletes are probably maybe squeaking by to right below that seven hour mark. And really, we should be aiming for between eight and 10 hours. When we look at sleep across the lifespan, and this is recommended duration according to the National Sleep Foundation, and we're looking at in blue here is kind of the recommended amount. The light blue may be appropriate, and then the yellow would not be recommended. When we go to some of the teens that you're working with, so 14 to 17 year olds, really wanna be aiming between eight and 10. Uh, for young adults, a little bit less between seven and nine. And this is just in everyday person. Um, we do think that athletes need more sleep. So that's also something to consider. And I know probably a lot of your athletes are not getting this amount, but I think um, providing them education and I'll talk about some of those strategies, hopefully we'll, we'll try and improve that a little bit. So one of the myths out there is, you know, I'm, I'm fine on little sleep and you may be even thinking of yourself. So as an adult, you need between seven and nine hours. You know, you're like, oh, you know, maybe I get six and I'm probably just a short sleeper. But what they find in the research is that there is one um, gene mutation that they found where a father and son duo were reporting between five and a half and four and a half hours of sleep per night. They were waking up refreshed. They had no memory impairments. And when they looked at how common this was, it was actually less than one in four million people actually had this gene mutation. So I think bottom line, the likelihood that is you is probably pretty slim. And I think with all these different kind of genes and mutation genotypes, it, it's probably a little bit higher than that. And I would say probably many sleep scientists would think around 1% of the population can get by on a lot, uh, a little less sleep and not have any um, memory impairment. So maybe six hours or less and not really have any of those memory impairments. So less than 1%. So I wanted to touch on quality of sleep as well. And so this was a survey I gave to the St. Francis ath Athletics, um, all of their different teams and found that it, the majority again, so we're looking at 67% um, were satisfied with their sleep, either somewhat satisfied or very satisfied with their overall sleep quality. And then about 26, well, 15, 22% were dissatisfied and then about 11% were neutral. So similar to kind of what we saw with the sleep duration, there are a number of, of athletes here who are dissatisfied with their sleep quality, which is a sign that um, they may be struggling with the sleep problem. So what is good quality sleep? Number one, falling asleep in less than 30 minutes, waking up no more than once per night, being awake for 20 minutes or less during the night after initially falling asleep, 
and then sleeping 85% of the time while in bed. So an example of this might be someone who goes to bed at 10 p.m. Let's see, let's say we have an athlete, adolescent athlete, and probably many of them may struggle with a 10 p.m. bedtime. But um, 10 p.m. bedtime, falling asleep in 20 minutes, so they're asleep by 10:20. They wake up around 3 a.m. Maybe use use the bathroom for 10 minutes and then potentially wake up for the day at 6.30. So this person would be getting eight hours, and they'd be falling asleep in less than 30 minutes, and they'd be waking up only once per night with a sleep efficiency of 94%. So um, meeting all of those criteria for what good quality sleep is. But I think in my current role, I'm actually, as uh, the Director of Clinical Sleep Science at Cerebra, um, we have very interesting EEG metric, metrics that we're using. So brainwave activity, looking at new ways to measure sleep depth. So it's not just about kind of how you feel. It's not even about even scoring this, this record for different sleep stages. I think on an even more deeper level, there can be sleep quality issues that are going on. And so I'm really interested in exploring that, um, looking at the brainwave activity to see kind of what disturbances are occurring. So this, this slide I prepared specifically for Kylo. Um, I know he's a big coffee drinker, but um, I, I wanted to, to mention this because coffee in the late afternoon doesn't hurt my sleep. Now, there was a study in adolescence where they gave them an energy drink at dinner time. So it was around 6 p.m., gave them the energy drink. They asked the participants, Do, did, did this coffee, did this energy drink affect your sleep? And what they found is that the majority of them reported, you know, no differences in their sleep at all. And um, they actually fell asleep normally. There was no changes in that when we look, when they looked at the brainwave activity. But when they looked at the deep sleep, so this is where growth hormone is being released, tissues are being repaired. This is, um, you know, one of the most important sleep stages for athletes specifically they found that there was about a 25% decrease in deep sleep when these participants had the energy drink. So you, I think we should all consider that coffee, you may not think it's impacting you, but it really could be hurting your sleep. And, it, and this is also for the athletes that you're working with. So let's look at timing. Um, so chronotype is our biological preference for being a night owl or an early bird. And what we see is about 15% are morning types, 15% are evening types, and then the rest of us kind of fall in between. Um, and actually, let me go back to that. Um, yeah, what we find is that a lot of time in adolescence, we see a tendency to be more of a night owl. And this has to do with biology. So there's been a number of studies showing that melatonin is released as much as two hours later than, you know, what, a, what an adult would have melatonin. Melatonin is our sleepiness hormone. So it, it's not that teens are lazy for wanting to sleep in. Um, I've had a couple of Twitter wars with strength and conditioning coaches. I'm not trying to throw them under the bus, but um, where they have these strength training practices at, you know, 6, 6 a.m. And they're doing this Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And um, obviously they've been put on pause for, for a while, but this is pre-pandemic. And, you know, they're making the claim that, oh, these athletes are coming in sleepy. They're they're not taking it seriously, you know, they just need to get to bed earlier. And that's, that's just not the way it works with their biology. So I think this is really important for coaches to understand that if you do have the option of having a training um, session later, that you take that option. So honestly, I would say 10 a.m. If you could choose your entire schedule, I would say 10 a.m. or later would be 
a, a way for your athletes to be rested coming into the training and, um, you know, really benefit by having a better training with more opportunity for sleep. And I don't want to go, <laughs> I could talk about this all day, but um, many people think that, oh, well, if, if the training session or if the school time is going to be later, that they're just going to, you know, go to bed later and not really get that much more sleep. And of course that's true. They do go to bed later, but when you look at school times being shifted to a later time, uh, we see increases in sleep. So um, I kind of take that model with training sessions as well, practices. If you can go for a later training time, I, I say go for it. It's just going to lead to better performance, better mood for your athletes. So this is just a graph of uh, ages along the bottom and then early bird chronotypes versus late chronotypes. And here you can see this is in 25,000 people that the peak in night owl nests, so more gravity towards that late chronotype is right around, you know, 19, 20 or so. And um, males have a harder time with that. So they're more likely to be an evening type. Um, and they may peak a little bit later, but you know we're starting to see cross that line. So this is kind of in between and then right around the age groups that you're working with. So 15, 16, 17, up to 20, um, you know, we do see more likelihood for a later chronotype. So that was my summary or that was my section on the science of sleep. So here's a little summary. You know, I talked about sleep serving vital functions for our health and the daylight saving time and what that did to uh, our health. Um, I, I busted some sleep myths, so not everyone needs eight hours based on, on those graphs. Um, short sleepers, you know, probably low likelihood that that's you or for your athletes as well. Um, coffee could be impacting your sleep. And then also, you know, teens just being related to their biology for wanting to sleep in. And then I talked about quantity of sleep. So eight to 10 hours for the athletes that you're working with, the quality, um, you know, falling asleep in less than 30 minutes and not waking up no more than once per night. And then timing is also key. So we see that later chronotype for our adolescents. So let's get to part two. So why is sleep important for athletes? Uh, this is one of my favorite slides actually, and I'm, I'm working on updating it because it is a bit, a bit older. Um, but here are different athletes along the bottom and then the amount of sleep that they're reporting to get across a 24 hour period. And this was back in 2011, so it definitely needs to be updated. But the point of this slide is that, you know, the majority of these, um, professional athletes, Olympic athletes are, are getting, you know, above that eight hour mark primarily. Um, we do have Tiger Woods there um, who wasn't much of a sleeper. And actually, I just want to mention that drowsiness may have been a factor in that, in that crash. I know they're, they're uh, investing, investigating that further. Um, but overall, we see, you know, LeBron James, 12 hours, Roger Federer, 11 to 12 hours, Michelle Wee, 10 to 12 hours. You know, a ton of these different athletes are really prioritizing the amount of sleep that they're getting. And I think this, this can create buy-in for, for the athletes that you're working with. Sleep helps reaction time. So one study found after 20 hours without sleep, reaction time was greater than 0.05, similar to being legally drunk. So they compared um, reaction time with sleep deprivation versus reaction time after drinking. And they found that, yeah, even, you know, even pulling an all-nighter, there are times during the night where you would be considered legally drunk when it came to reaction time. And, you know, we would never, I would hope, show up to a practice, obviously, and your athletes are younger, but um, legally drunk, but there may be some of your athletes out there who are potentially pulling an all-nighter depending on finals and midterms, et cetera. So something to consider. And then um, in this particular study, they found quicker reaction time being reported in swimmers off the starting block. 
This has been replicated for basketball players showing quicker sprint times, quicker reaction times, and also in rugby players as well. And I'll talk a little bit about those last two studies coming up. Uh, sleep, sleep helps in decision making. So I think, you know, many of your athletes may not be drinking or anything along those lines, but um, there is a risk or an increased risk of risky behavior um, when it comes to less sleep. So here's a comparison of less than eight hours of sleep versus those who were getting more than eight hours of sleep. And then basically for each of these risky behaviors, we see an increased, um, increased report of the less than eight hours doing that activity versus those who are getting more than eight hours. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And then um, in a different study, they found a week of five hours per night led to riskier decision-making without even realizing it. And I think that's, that's really interesting to me because these people were making riskier decisions and they had no clue that their decisions were riskier. And this was, you know, kind of a simulated study where it's, you gam, you know, it's like a gambling task. Um, but yeah, that was really interesting to me that they did not even realize that they were making these riskier decisions. Were they in the same age group in study one or was it like college versus other people? This one, um, it, I believe it was in high school, uh, high school. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was definitely, it was high school aged yeah, like um, participants. Yeah, okay. So an important aspect of sleep also is it helps athletes stay in the game. And um, as it relates to immunity and as it relates to injury risk. So here is just kind of a summary. We find that when the amount of sleep goes down, inflammation goes up. That's kind of a relationship that we find in the research. And this, is, this was a really interesting study where they studied people's sleep using a sleep watch. So objective measure of sleep coming into the study. So they asked them to wear the watch for a couple of weeks prior to the study. And then what they did was they exposed them to a cold virus. So they put a swab down their nose um, and then looked at, <laughs> they even measured tissues as it related to mucus production. A really, really great study. And what they found was that there was a relationship between um, greater amounts of sleep and less likelihood to catch that cold. So of course, you know, there's going to be a chance of catching the cold if you're exposed to it, but it looked as if sleep protected them from catching that cold. So this was greater than seven hours. This is in adults. And then they found that those who were getting less than five hours, um, it's kind of hard to see here, but it was a 45% chance of catching that cold. So really interesting that it was a dose kind of relationship. And this was looking at sleep duration. Uh, also injury risk. So there's a greater risk of injury if the sleep is, is not as sufficient. So here we see average sleep per night and hours. So five hours all the way up to nine hours. And this was in adolescent, um, adolescent athletes who were at an elite, elite school. So these are really elite adolescent athletes. And what they found was that as sleep de decreased, there was a greater likelihood of being injured. And they studied that, I think, six months um, for this particular study. So athletes who, who sleep on average less than eight hours per night were about two times more likely to be injured than those who were sleeping eight or more hours. And so that's kind of my summary for part two. So why sleep is important for an athlete uh, pros are doing it. I showed you that slide there. Uh, sleep helps athletes stay in the game as it relates to immunity and injury risk. And then also, you know, those important uh, factors such as reaction time and decision making. Um, oh, sorry, I, I didn't include that slide on uh, academics, but uh, we do see 
uh, relationships with uh, better grades, better, less accidents, less car accidents, better mood for, um, for those who are getting better sleep. So let's look at part three. What can you actually do as a coach? I think the first step is to educate and emphasize the importance of sleep. So that's really important. And potentially, you know, bringing some, not to like promote myself or anything, but bringing a sleep expert in to potentially do a sleep information session for your athletes and framing it as it relates to performance, because that's how they're going to buy in potentially. So having sleep information sessions uh, periodically. Um, and what this study found was that after this sleep information session, they found that there was about a 20 minute increase in sleep duration per night. This was in athletes in um, these two particular studies. And, but when they looked at it, so those two studies were about a two week time frame after the sleep information session. When they looked at it one month later, they found that it wasn't maintained. So they didn't continue to increase their sleep quantity. And that's why I think it's really important to have an action, actionable, individualized plan. I think it's important to emphasize sleep, check in regularly with your athletes as it relates to sleep. Um, and I'll talk about a few other strategies. But I, I wanted to show this. This was an individualized schedule for a speed skater needing about eight hours. I don't know how I, I don't know if I can, uh, yeah, I don't think I can make that smaller. Um, or I could probably just move it. Let me do that so you can see the whole slide. Um, I think we can see the full slide on our side, Amy. Oh, you can, okay, good. Okay, I perfect. So. I was seeing a bar on my end. Okay, so this is an individualized plan for a speed skater needing eight hours of sleep. So for this particular athlete, they kind of identified, you know, this was a 20, 21 year old um, that they needed about eight hours of sleep. And so you don't wanna be in bed for eight hours because it does take you time to fall asleep. You will wake up during the middle of the night. So for this particular athlete, we wanted them to be in bed for nine hours. And um, their latest wake up time was 7.30 a.m. So we basically subtracted nine hours from that to get a bedtime of 10.30 p.m. And then instituted kind of a technology curfew, which I know is probably pretty challenging for the athletes you're working with. But teams like um, the women's hockey team, they, you know, during competitions, they will collect all the phones. And, um, and I've heard of a, a few other teams that have done that as well. Um, dimming the lights so we don't want to be in a really bright environment up until bedtime you know potentially dimming those lights and then implementing blue light blocking glasses so um, that may be a strategy for your athletes who are on their phone 100 percent of the time um, although i will say that it's not just about the blue light but it's also about the content that they're looking at from the devices so the best piece of advice would be to put away the devices an hour before bedtime and then adding in a nap for this athlete and then you know the schedule can vary a little bit on on their days off here sorry i was doing my pointer on the other screen um but it all adds up so it's not just you know, it may be challenging if we tell an athlete, we want you to get an hour more sleep each and every night. I think that may not be possible in many instances, but I think adding it up all across the week, so 30 minutes, maybe 30 minutes more per night, um, will give you three and a half hours across the week. Adding in some naps will give you an hour, adding in a longer nap, hour and a half, and then maybe a sleep in on days off. Of course, we don't want to extend that too much we you know we want to be reasonable we don't want to sleep in till noon necessarily um gives you seven hours across the week so i think at all it adds up it definitely adds up 
Um, I do have this sleep plan, which I will make available. And I think Susan's gonna put that in the chat for me. Uh, let me see if I can find this so I can show you what that looks like. So I do, I do consulting and a lot of times I'll kind of create a schedule for, um, for a client and, um, this, you guys can use this. So you guys, I, I don't, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but you know, use it as you wish, I guess. Um, but here we have, you know, increasing sleep across the week, keeping bedtimes and wake times consistent and improving sleep quality are kind of some of those main interventions. Um, and then again, as I showed you in the previous slide, so uh, different scheduling depending on the day. So there may be a Tuesday, Thursday strength training session. So that day may differ than Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then weekends may differ. So they're able to put in, um, you know, different types of schedule depending on the day and then can uh, create a wake time, a bedtime. So starting with the ideal amount of sleep that they think they should get, which can be challenging um, to know, but when they're feeling rested, um, I can talk about that more later if you're interested, but uh, having that latest wake up time here and then subtracting backwards to see the amount, uh, the time that they would need to go to bed. And then from that point, then, you know, subtract an hour for that bedtime routine, put away the electronics, potentially wear the blue blocking glasses, and then napping. And also getting light outside is really important to help set our rhythms for the day. So there's a bunch of information in here, and it kind of summarizes what I talk about in the, in the talk anyway. So this is a good resource for you to have. Um, there's a number of uh, different tips for napping, your environment, what that should look like. Uh, nappuccino, should I have caffeine prior to a nap? I think that takes a little bit of exper experimenting, but of course you wouldn't want to have that too late. And then there's some breathing techniques here as well in the cognitive shuffle, which I'll discuss a little bit later. But um, yeah, so that'll be a good resource for you to hopefully utilize with your athletes. Okay. Um, the next part is monitoring sleep. So who has a problem and who doesn't? Um, you know, it's really hard for you as coaches to understand that. So that's why this was the screening tool that I developed. So Susan's gonna put in the chat uh, the link to this questionnaire and I'll show you kind of what that looks like. So you go to the page at centerforsleep.com which is uh, based in Calgary actually and um, you go here and you you just say I'm a high performance athlete and then um, then it'll start asking you questions as it relates to the amount of sleep that you're getting, how many naps, are you satisfied with your sleep quality, time it takes you to fall asleep, et cetera. So it's looking at quantity of sleep, quality of sleep and timing of sleep. We're also asking about electronic devices, caffeine. And um, so you can take this quiz or have your athletes take this quiz. And then they're, they're, it categorizes them into no sleep problem, mild sleep problem, moderate or severe sleep problem, which is where you would want to probably seek help from a sleep professional. So that's a really great resource. It's freely available. The athletes can email you the results, you know, as a coach. Um, and, oh, they get uh, sleep education as well and tips on jet lag. And I, I forgot to ask if jet lag is, is, is a part of um, what you're doing. I don't, we can talk about that if you have questions specifically on jet lag too. So that's a really great resource. And what we found, this was in 199 Canadian national team athletes. We found that about 25% had a sleep problem where they needed help from a sleep, sleep specialist. Um, but with these recommendations, with the education that we provided them, which is partly included in that quiz that you know, the athletes will, will take, 
um, we found improvements in sleep with these recommendations. So the severe went down to more of a moderate, the moderate went down to more of a mild, and then the none didn't really change um, their sleep between this, uh, I believe it was, oh, five month period. Banking sleep is another great strategy. So studies have shown that banking sleep can um, improve free throw percentage, uh, also improve tennis accuracy by 6%. And then again, that rugby study that I mentioned, so reduce reaction time by 4% in cortisol, reduce cortisol by 19%. So that's stress hormone. So, and these, these sleep extension or banking sleep studies. Um, so I guess I should explain what that means, but uh, in this particular study in basketball players, they told them to be in bed for 10 hours. And these athletes were only getting less than seven hours of sleep per night. They told them to be in bed for 10 hours and they almost increased their sleep per night by almost two hours. So this period of time was about six weeks or so. Um, and they found, you know, the better free throw percentage, the quicker reaction time, better mood, um, and better, I think it was three point percentage. And at that point, I think Stanford was the previous year they were, you know, they didn't even make the playoffs, uh, the Pac-10 tournament, I think at that time. Um, and then, then they all of a sudden, you know, during the study, they, they did a lot better as a team. So that was really great to see. Um, and then this particular study, I think it was only about a week of of sleep extension. So a week of like an hour more in bed and they found that these really great results. And then this study was around two weeks where they found um, improvements in reaction time in rugby players. So really, um, I think that's a good strategy for approaching the Canada Summer Games to be able to, obviously you have a bit of time, but um, leading into that competition and leading into other important competitions to tell your athletes to get more sleep leading into this, you know, maybe you might be tapering anyway. And so it might be a good opportunity for them to get more sleep as we lead into this competition, which will then ease some anxiety when it comes to, um, oh no, I'm going to get a poor night's sleep before the competition. And and sleep deprivation studies have found that if you get more sleep than you usually get leading into this sleep deprivation period, you perform a lot better. So I think this is a good way for athletes to perform better during the competition, but it also is a good strategy for reducing anxiety about getting a poor night's sleep prior to the competition. It's not going to really impact you much if you're getting good sleep leading into that. Pre-sleep routine is important. And I think it's important in situations where you may be traveling. Um, it's important in situations where you have a late night competition. You know, you need this routine. It's not just for toddlers. We need it for adults. We need it for athletes. Um, and so having a pre-sleep routine is going to be key to help your brain and body relax before bedtime. And, you know, you're, you're kind of an analogy of that would be you're on a highway going, you know, hundred kilometers per hour and you need to get off the highway. And what do you do when you get off the highway, you break gradually. And so that's kind of an analogy of what we need to do prior to sleep. We can't just go 100 kilometers per hour and then expect to be able to, you know, all throughout the day and then expect to just be able to fall asleep instantly. You got to break and you got to um, gradually prepare your mind and your body for sleep. So here's a couple of things that athletes or yourselves could put into your pre-sleep routine. So turning off electronic devices, preparing for the next day, um, warm bath or shower has been shown to improve sleep quality relaxing activities, gratefulness has been, you know, having a gratitude journal has been shown to have better sleep quality, 
writing a to-do list was interesting. Um, they, in this particular study, they wrote a to-do list, everything they had to do right before bedtime and, um, and ended up falling asleep quicker. And it's just offloading those thoughts, putting them on paper, and then you're more, you know, able to just kind of relax. And then breathing exercises and stretching, which I'll talk about, and reading a paper book as well has been shown too. Those are kind of some evidence-based strategies for improving overall sleep duration and sleep quality. Napping is huge and a lot, uh, not many athletes are really napping or taking advantage of this. Only about a third in the 200 athletes we studied, um, a third didn't nap at all, which was crazy. And then, you know, 80% napped two or more times, two or less times per week. So only about 20% were napping three or more times per week. So um, this is something I think athletes should really take advantage of. Duration of the nap. So there's kind of two different kinds of naps. So there's more of a power nap. So that would be less than 30 minutes. So in this case, about a 20 minute nap, setting alarm for 30 minutes. And then if you can't fall asleep in 10 minutes, you know, you may reset your alarm. And then for a longer nap, getting all of those stages of sleep, uh, it'd be about 90 minutes and not set an alarm, maybe an emergency alarm. But the goal of both of these naps is to wake up prior to the alarm. So wake up naturally, and it can take a bit of practice. The timing of sleep of this nap should be between 1 and 4 p.m. And then the environment should be cool, dark, and quiet, like a cave. And um, this goes for even at night as well, not just during the nap. We want to have the sleep environment cool, dark, and quiet, and just basically like a cave. Um, and that'll help when sleeping in different environments, on the road, um, along with that pre-sleep routine. And then let me go into some of these techniques and I have that on the plan. So you will have a reference for these, but I mentioned the to-do list. Another one is four, seven, eight breathing. So breathe in for four seconds, hold your breath for seven seconds, breathe out for eight seconds. So um, you're basically breathing out longer than you're breathing in. And that's kind of the key and that'll activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So this one's a really good one. And last night, so I was supposed to have that interview this morning and I ended up waking up and it's, you know, 7.30 my time. Um, I ended up waking up two hours before my alarm, just kind of maybe stressed for this, this interview. Um, and I tried the four, seven, eight breathing technique. I did that four times. Then I started to do the cognitive shuffle, which is think of a word such as bedtime. Imagine all the objects that you can, starting with B, so ball, baby, bus, banana, and then move on to the next letter, eagle, egg, uh, ear, et cetera. Um, and hopefully by the time you get to the end of the word, you will be sound asleep. So for me, I tried that and it actually, it didn't work. I think just the stress of um, was just kind of keeping me awake. And the best thing to do after that is to get up out of bed and do a relaxing activity until you feel sleepy enough again to fall asleep. So I call it the 20 minute rule. So if it's been about 20 minutes and you don't want to stare at the clock, but if it's been about 20 minutes, and you can't go back to sleep, you wanna get up out of bed and only return to your bed when you're sleepy. And this goes for going to bed as well. You don't wanna to go to bed wide awake um, cause we don't wanna start associating the bed with being awake. So that's kind of the main premise to that. And then again, caffeine strategically. So I had a little bit of information on that, um, but caffeine does impact the ability to fall asleep and is harmful to sleep quality. There was a study in super rugby athletes where 20% of them ended up pulling an all-nighter after consuming caffeine during an evening game. And that just takes, and obviously it's not just due to caffeine, you know, there's adrenaline going, there's partying. Um, so it's not just due to the caffeine, but I think that's pretty significant, you know, 20%. And 
and it takes multiple, multiple days um, to recover from that. And I worked at a sleep lab during my graduate work where we sleep deprived people three times for 36 hours. I did another study where we sleep deprived them for 62 hours, so two full nights without sleep. Um, and just looking at, at how they reacted to that, it can, they weren't even recovered by the time they left the study. So not even two nights of 12 hours in bed were they recovered from pulling that all nighter. So that was uh, pretty interesting to me. And then I think caffeine, it also depends on your genotype. So some people are more fast metabolizers. Some people are more slow metabolizers. And in this particular study, they found in this time trial of a cycling time trial, they found that the slow metabolizers actually performed worse an hour after consuming the caffeine. Um, so they, their performance was impaired 14% compared to placebo when they were in that caffeine condition. So um, yeah, I think that's just something for people to keep in mind as well is that, you know, caffeine doesn't necessarily improve your performance across the board. And then alcohol, I just wanted to mention this. There may be a few of your athletes, um, sorry about that, drinking. And um, we know that, or potentially you, you know, potentially some coaches out there may be using it for a sleep aid. And we have seen an increase in alcohol consumption during the pandemic as well. Um, and, you know, that could be related to these increases in insomnia symptoms. But we know that, you know, it does help you fall asleep quicker, but what ends up happening is it just kills your recovery and you end up waking up more during the middle of the night without potentially even realizing it. So this study, this was a small study, a high number of drinks, approximately three hours before bedtime, definitely impacted recovery. Um, but they found that with lower, basically the lower amount of alcohol that you're drinking and the furthest away from bedtime, it doesn't seem to be as disruptive. So maybe a glass of wine with dinner is not such a big deal. Um, but I noticed for myself, I noticed that, yeah, my sleep quality is definitely impaired. Um, even if I have just one glass of wine with dinner. So it's just something to be aware of. So limiting drinks to lower doses and then not drinking too close to bedtime. So that was, that was, uh, that was my presentation. I'll just kind of go through the summary here and then we'll have some time for questions. Um, so remember educating and emphasizing the importance of sleep, uh, really checking in with your athletes throughout the season. Um, monitoring their sleep and getting help when needed. So probably the best timing for that would be preseason, potentially, you know, postseason, because then if they do need to see a sleep professional, you know, we can do that during the off season. It's not a, quite as disruptive. Uh, banking sleep is a great strategy, getting more sleep leading into that competition, which will help performance as well as ease anxiety. Uh, having that good pre-sleep routine, which is great for traveling on the road and after those late night competitions. And then providing nap opportunities. So um, encouraging naps, you know, you may not be with your athletes all day, but um, definitely potentially encouraging some nap opportunities would be good. And then just using caffeine and alcohol strategically. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Um, you can find me on social media, on Twitter and Instagram at Sleep for Sport. I'm also working on a website, sleepwelltowin.com. Um, and actually, I just got a book deal too to, um, to write a book on sleep in athletes. And it'll probably be geared towards adolescent athletes. So that's pretty exciting for me. Um, of course, it's going to take some time before that's out. But um, yeah, those are the places you can find me. And then if you wouldn't mind, I think Susan's gonna put in the chat, uh, just a quick two minute evaluation of this presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing and then I'll take any questions. And I have, I know I, oh, we only have three minutes for questions, but I can take, I can go a little bit beyond the time here since I um, 
blabbered away. So, um, so yeah, I'll take any questions. And you can either type it in the chat if you'd like or unmute, whatever works for you. I do have to say, um, I was gonna put in there that uh, my dog is very good at going 180% kind of, and then dropping dead and sleeping instantly and snoring profusely. <laughs> but I am not like that at all. And <laughs> I saw that people don't do that, but man, my dog sure can. <laughs> Wish. I know, wouldn't that be nice? I know. They sleep all day, I swear. Yeah. Any questions at all for Dr. Bender? I just have a question about napping. Just personally, I am worse if I nap. I wake up grouchy and nobody wants me to take a nap during the day. Oh, really? I don't sleep well at night either. So I would love to be able to nap. But is that unusual if we're trying to get that into our athletes to start doing that? Oh, well, what's the duration of your naps? Uh, they're usually an hour to an hour and a half when I okay. do them, but I don't do them very often. It, it's usually because I fell asleep because I couldn't stay awake. And it's usually because I didn't sleep well the night before. Mm -hmm. But I wait, like I said, I wake up feeling sick. I wake up grouchy and I have trouble sleeping that next night. Yeah, yeah. Um, for athletes with insomnia, we want to be aware of, you know, if they were to take a nap, how that will impact their ability to fall asleep. So that is a consideration. Um, I, I would recommend for you to, uh, take a shorter nap. So what's happening likely is that you're getting into those deeper stages of sleep. You're getting into stage three sleep. You may be getting into REM sleep. Primarily the stage three sleep is usually between, you know, 45, well, I say below a half hour because it can vary a lot. So you could be getting into deep sleep, you know, maybe minute 30 up until minute, you know, 90 or so. Um, so when we wake up in deep sleep, we do, we are groggy, you know, it could take 90 minutes or so for that to wear off. So um, that would be my recommendation um, is to try and go for a shorter nap. Maybe I'll throw something out there because I have about 10 of them written down around my page uh, to ask, but I'll just start with one because everyone else might have something. Um, you talked about reading a paper book at nighttime and that being a, an, an activity to help with uh, sleep preparation. Um, but then the question I have is around brain activity and engagement. Um, so is that something to be aware of depending on the type of book, so a novel that might get you excited or uh, your heart racing versus something that something else in your how your brain reacts to that paper book that you're reading? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I don't think there's been any research looking at that specifically. I think even just with the electronic devices, they're trying to kind of parse that out. Um, but yeah, in, you know, I heard at one point from someone saying you should be reading a fiction book. Um, so something more imaginative. I, I didn't ever look into that. It was not necessarily a sleep scientist saying that, but a health expert saying that. Um, so that may be, that may be a good thing. Um, but yeah, I could foresee a suspense thriller, you know, impacting raising the cortisol levels raising sympathetic nervous system activity could be uh definitely impacting so yeah that may be a consideration okay kyla did you want to ask one more i'll let you have one more before we kind of Maybe not uh, necessarily a question, but a, a comment to uh, one of the slides you talked about in bringing someone in to talk about sleep sessions. And so uh, we had uh, working with a group of 16 year old uh, male athletes 
had a session and it was um, with Dr. Krelarz, but it was about the uh, substance. It was a much, it was a, a wide ranging topic. Um, and within that context, sleep was one of the things he touched on. Very briefly, wasn't a priority of the conversation. Uh, two years later, that one of our athletes uh, brought up the information specific to sleep and how they took that bit of information and utilized it. It was one of our, it was our goalie at the time um, around the reaction time and sort of really spoke to him. And so it was really interesting that, you know, out of all the topics of that conversation, that was the one that stuck with him two years later, still pulling up that data and that information and something that I think he integrated. So it really is uh, a, an interesting topic that the athletes do. We share that with them, either bringing someone in or making sure we share it, that a lot of the athletes will integrate themselves. And so to your point earlier about how we can influence uh, sleep with our athletes, I think, you know, there really are ways in which we can do that, that we might omit as coaches. Wow. Yeah, that's really, that's really great. Maybe I'm having, maybe I'm having a bigger influence on these athletes than I think. Who knows? Okay. Um, yes. One of the, in the chat says someone's going to be using that sleep questionnaire. So that's great. Thank you for providing that. That is fantastic. Absolutely. Okay. If there is nothing else, thank you so much, Dr. Bender, for coming on and discussing this really important um, topic that not a lot of people think about. I was actually thinking about you know, kind of as mission staff at games and things like that, the, the possible lack of sleep that we might get during kind of the games and just the chaotic, I know, I get usually 12 hours of sleep that each night, but you know, the chaoticness of the games and, and things like that, how that changes everyone's kind of sleep cycle. Um, so just something to kind of think about moving forward to as we get into the games, so. Great, thank well, you. thank you for having me. Yes, thank you so much. And anyone have anything else before we, we sign off? Okay, well, thank you. Oh, I have go a ahead, quick Janine. specific question, but I don't know if. Oh, okay. <laughs> we do the like row at sunrise <laughs> because the water, sorry, I could, should I have it on my TV right now there. I should take it off my TV. So I'm like actually looking at the camera and not looking at the television. I plugged it in for the bigger screen. Um, but so we row like at 5.30 in the morning. So obviously for some of the athletes, it's like, um, I've been getting more sleep in COVID than I've had in the past. I don't even know how many years it's like crazy, but, um, we'll be back at it next week. But so we row like early, some high school, some university kids, but so, and some of them do nap. Uh, I do know that from some of it sort of depends on the day and their classes and all that and more university kids than the high school kids because they have that flexibility other than this year which they do have a bit more but so because they can't like I mean to get a super long sleep you're going to bed at a unreasonably early out like instead of dinner you're going to bed if you're really trying to get your like yeah yeah full time so would you recommend like should i be recommending naps or suggesting that they fit them in even if it's 20 minutes at lunchtime if they could like on their lunch break close their eyes or in a spare or something like just to yeah i mean, I mean in, in um, the dark room i was uh working with the canadian olympic team uh swimmers in it was in victoria yep. um and it, it was crazy to me that they didn't have a say in the time that they could, I mean, these are Olympic level swimmers and it was like a shared facility and it's like they had swim classes at these times. So there was no opportunity for changing that schedule. And uh, for them, it was taking a longer nap. So yeah, I should have mentioned this and obviously there are limitations if they have school and they don't have the flexibility. So in that case, taking a short nap is great. Like encourage the heck out of it, have them schedule it as a part of their training. But for um, these swimmers, you know, they had early morning training and then they would take an hour and a half to two hour nap 
to try and make up for some of that lost sleep. The nap was occurring early on in the day, so it didn't impact their ability to fall asleep at night. And so that's what I would recommend um, if there's no flexibility to take longer naps to make up for some of that lost nighttime sleep. Um, but in the instance where they can't, uh, taking even a short 10 minute nap every single day, you know, will, will may not lead to a ton of sleep across the week, but it will have improvements in alertness and performance. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you again for all taking some time out of your night to, uh, be with us tonight. And we will send out um, the next session as soon as we kind of confirm the date. And this session has been recorded, so it will be available um, in the next little bit. I'm not sure where, I believe it'll be on the game site. There you go. So you can use this presentation for your athletes for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. And good luck tomorrow morning get some sleep Dr. Oh, Bender. yeah I'll try I'll try maybe uh some of you can tune in <laughs> okay excellent well good night everyone and have a great rest of your Wednesday evening get some good sleep thank you well good night <laughs>